everybody. Welcome to the Straight Out of BS podcast again. Uh, wow, I'm pretty much speechless. Um, we're almost actually monetized on this channel. We're less than 100 subscribers away from being monetized and less than 1,000 hours away from, or 1,000 views away from being monetized. I want to thank all my Patreon members, everybody that supported the podcast so far. I never thought that I would be able to make this much of an impact. I honestly thought that this was going to be maybe one of those things where I'd get maybe a thousand views on one of my videos eventually. But now <coughs> I have several videos that have several thousand views. So thank you guys so much for the support. Um, the program was just fucking phenomenal. Um, just like blew me away. And uh, just let's just keep on getting the word out about these places. Let's get them shut down. We're ha we have a whole lot of momentum right now. So let's keep on riding this wave. Just keep them momentum going. Uh, it's it's the best way to make change. If anybody's interested in sharing their story, just send me an email at straightoutofbs at gmail.com. Once again, thank you to the Patreon members. If anybody's interested in that, links are in the description. I also wanted to remind people that if they, because I had a couple people reach out about the merch, the, the, the shirts. They wanted to wear the shirts while they're doing the podcast to wear it around town. Uh, there are, There is merch available. There's plenty of it. Um, there's links for that in the description too, just for anybody that's interested in supporting the podcast that way. And without further ado, I want to do a moment of silence for the person still suffering with addiction or intrusive thoughts or anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you for that. And also one more thing, <clears throat> one more announcement. I'm in the brainst brainstorming phases of and it's in the infancy stages, so this isn't like something that I've fully committed to, but I am in the brainstorming phases of making a Spring Creek Lodge documentary. So um, I'm working on that. So if anybody's interested in sharing their story or helping with that, reach out to me. I'm not sure exactly what kind of help I need yet because it's just me doing this right at the moment, but I'll reach out and let you know how you can be of, of assistance. And now, without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce a return guest for the day. Uh, go ahead and reintroduce yourself and where you went again. Um, well, my name is Dustin Bowman. I'm in the Spring Creek Lodge from uh, 1998 to 99. Uh, my brother was in the program for about three years. He did two years in Samoa before he was transferred to Spring Creek Lodge, and he graduated the program. Um, so uh, we didn't. I was one. I was think I was like your third or fourth interview when you first started this, yeah. uh, and everything. And I'm happy to share things. And I'm just 100% like proud of you and like everything that uh, you've it's grown into. You know, people giving a platform for people to share. Sorry, I know the wind's really bad. <laughs> But uh, given a platform for everybody to share their experiences, whether they be good, whether they be bad, you know, just memories sometimes, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, a lot of us block a lot of stuff out. And it's yeah. not necessarily that it was traumatic that we blocked out, but, you know, holy f S, <laughs> we forgot about it. Yeah. Like, I didn't remember that. Like, but as soon as somebody mentioned it, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I remember that. Yeah. You know, what are, and what are some of those things for you that, that you didn't remember until recently? <laughs> um, well, today, actually, I was scrolling through, and it's been blowing up on my Facebook feed and everything, uh, the, the multiple groups and stuff that we're in, straight out of BS, the Spring Creek Lodge Academy, the WWAS survivors. You know, it's being woken up in the middle of the night and doing the wheel. And being hit with the fucking fire hose. Like, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I did reconnect with uh, somebody that was there around the time that I was. You know, and apparently there have been a few people who have claimed to be there, but not really. So, I had to go through the uh, gauntlet of questionnaire, which, you know, I'm okay with. Mm -hmm. I couldn't answer all the questions because, you know... Apparently, everybody remembers the road that Spring Creek was on. I did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. but I, I I still mentioned about, like, you know, we started talking about, you know, food at the Hungry Horse. You know, the um, the no -bake cookies. What were the best things about it? Who was, you know, the English teacher who did this? And, you know, I answered what I could. Yeah. You know, and then eventually she's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah. You actually went there. I'm like, yeah, I did. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it really is too. It's kind of too bad that we have to sometimes, you know, kind of drill people like that. But at the same time, there have been people that have infiltrated these groups before that have been. Well, here's the thing: is the a similarity for me is I spent ten and a half years in you know active duty service. Mm -hmm. So when people are claiming to have served or been through this or that, I do the same thing. So I wasn't offended at all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I yeah. couldn't answer everything because I, you know, don't remember things the same way, but all it takes is honesty. Exactly. Exactly. And once, the, once you say a few specific things, they're like, okay, you went there. You couldn't have known that without going there. You know what I mean? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, as uh, I think in my first, uh, our first interview, we talked about how I was there before they built the new cabins. On upper level or lower level? Um, uh, down below, like in 2008, uh, when I first got there, it was in the Grand Teton, which was across from the Hungry Horse. Mm -hmm. That was Unity above Family. It. Above it, correct? Your intervention. Yep, right above it. it. It's kind of like an eight. It was like an A-frame cabin almost. Yep. 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 So they built the new cabins, and I remember because they had the, uh, you know, security magnets on the doors and everything else, and people have been posting pictures about, you know, the bunk beds with, the, you know, six baskets underneath, and I was like, oh, yeah, forgot about that. Yep, got to have everything you know, the, nice and everything like that. Yeah, and so what I talked with you previously before, you know, we started this was talking about, like, as we go on with our lives and everything, I mean, we can talk about the traumatic, we can talk about how it affected us. Yeah. But we also have to acknowledge the good things that it's brought to us, too. Yeah. Even if we don't realize until later that, holy crap, that actually helped us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if it's something as simple as, like, I was addicted to drugs and I would have died if I hadn't been anywhere. Anywhere. Like, I would have died if I had been at home type thing you know even if it's something like that you know that's a good thing that you're alive that's actually kind of interesting that you bring that up because i got sent to the program for i ran away for a weekend because i got smoking i got caught smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. you know and uh my brother was already in there for two years he didn't need drugs or anything but he was getting kind of out of hand and violent at home you know but you know same thing happened to me woken up at three o'clock in the morning Except for I knew who my kidnappers were. You know, I was like, ah, okay. How did, how did you know them? Um, because uh, my brother was in the program for two years before I was sent there. So I went through the seminars. I went through Discovery and Focus and, you know, got to meet other parents and everything that were part of it. You know, who kids were in there. And so I knew exactly who came and picked me up. You know, I wasn't going to, like, fight or anything against. I would have had more respect if my parents would have driven me there personally. Because I still would have listened. Because my dad was a very military man growing up. So, you're damn right. If he says, get in the car, we're going. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> did you have, did you have a, uh, how was your upbringing? Did we go into that at all last time? Um, I think we touched base on it, but, um... Not a whole lot. I mean, so you want early childhood? You want teenage years? I'm just kind of curious. Like you said, your you said your dad was a military man. So was he yeah. very authoritative and telling you what to do? Uh, how how was how was it growing up? How was it in the well, house? Well, uh, well, I mean, authoritative. You know, you give your word. You know, you tell me one thing, then we're gonna go off of it. Um, I remember that I couldn't go spend the weekend with anybody unless I gave them an entire itinerary on what we're going to go do, which as a teenager, we're pretty much kind of like, uh, I really don't know what we're going to do. Like we talked about riding bikes or whatever, but we don't exactly have the entire thing planned out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You don't have a plan usually when you're a teenager <laughs> most of the time. You're well, yeah. And I grew up, uh, I grew up kind of like a little bit out, off the beaten path out in the country a little bit, you know, about took about 20 miles to get back into town, which the people who I wanted to go over and spend time with lived in town. <clears throat> so a lot of time it was a no. Um, we kind of had a small farm. We had a couple of cows, a horse, some chickens, some pigs, dogs, wolves, you know, and so they had to be fed and chores had to be done, you know, mowing the lawn and everything, which, 
you know, it's, it's what you had to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't a bad thing. I mean, it kind of helped shape me into who I am today. Yeah. You, well, you had structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was very much a structure. So when I went to Spring Creek, um, structure I was used to. I was okay with that. Like, ah, I can get behind this. I kind of pretended like it was ROTC. Yeah. Mm. Yep. And for our for people that don't know what ROTC mm. is, what is that? Um, pretty much like, uh, oh god. So essentially, like building you up to be like a military officer, like structure academy, like push up, because we did PT like two or three times a day at Spring Creek. You know, we had like specified child times we had you know in bed by this time you have homework you have this you know pretty much like without the glorification of afterwards you might actually get a scholarship yeah yeah <laughs> so that was essentially boot camp um yeah for a matter of speaking so when i actually went through boot camp uh i was like okay it's a head game i've been through this before mm-hmm. yeah. did you mm-hmm. um what did you find? Uh, let's see. What did we touch on? Uh, process. Do you remember a lot of the processes of the seminars? Um, I remember discovering focus because I've been through those multiple times, graduated them multiple times. But apparently, when you get dropped, they're like, "Well, you didn't learn your lesson." <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So you get sent back through them. So I remember with discovery, it was all about discovering the inner child. Yeah. You know, type of thing. Yeah. You know, like, I never lost out of that before I even went into it. You know, and there's a lot of traumas that a lot of other people that I was around, like, they had it way worse than I did. Mm-hmm. You know, talking about, you know, getting the aggression out, getting the frustration out, and then the whole talking yourself back up, like, oh, I'm a beautiful, strong, independent person. Even to this day, I still don't feel that way. Like, I when I'm with somebody, I'm a codependent person. Yeah. You know, it's not that I need their compliments or anything, but I need that person, not to make me happy, but to feel loved. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people are like, well, you can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. Yeah. I yeah. love who the fuck I am. Yeah. But I've been through so much in my life that who I am doesn't mean worth a goddamn thing to other people. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like with a lot of us especially like we have such deep seated traumas that like we just like for me I just feel I just want somebody there just just to be there you know what I mean I don't I feel like I'm alone a lot of the time you know and even though I have a bunch of survivors behind me they're not here with me they're not physically here with me you know what I mean they're there but they're not physically here you know what I mean so it makes yeah. it makes mm-hmm. it really hard sometimes um do you, what was your thoughts on the lifeboat process? Did you get, did you vote uh, live or die on yourself? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember on myself, but I remember I went through with like quite a lot of people and I gave more lives than I was allowed to give. Did they, get, did they call you out for that? Yeah, yeah, no, I got called out for it. And, you know, me being a defiant teenager at that time, because, you know, it was a matter of, like, who am I to choose who lives or dies? Seriously. Yeah, exactly. You know, if I could give a lifeboat or a life ring to anybody or everybody, then I'm going to do everything that I can. Yeah. I you know, that. and that, that, that's the thing about self-sacrifice is a fact. That it's not the fact that you feel that your life is worthless. But... If you recognize the beauty of what other people bring and the impact that you can make on a, somebody else by even sacrificing yourself. I mean, that's the whole thing in the military, right? Combat freaking scenarios, you're willing to freaking lay down your life if you have to just to make it better for somebody else. And I'm not talking about people back at home. I'm talking, I became friends with people who I served with in country that were Iraqis. Yeah. Yep. So it's not always a choice as far as like, well, you have to choose. Sometimes, all right, well, whatever it is, it's going to be, but I'm going to fight my tooth and nail to make it not that way just because you say it is. Yeah. 
And also I feel like being around people for me brings out more creativity in me. Sometimes being around other people and just in that in that bubble and in that vibe with them around kind of, kind of brings out stuff in me. At least for well, me, exactly. you know? <clears throat> and I feel like sometimes by myself, I get so caught in my head. You know what I mean? That it's hard for me well, to do happen. things. You know, but you've been doing, you've been doing a lot of freaking interviews and, you know, things and you've gotten a lot more information, a lot different takes on things. But the thing is, is you're opening an avenue for so many out there that either have needed an avenue or have never had an avenue. Yeah, or did, 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 they just thought like they were completely alone or some people didn't even realize that they like so there's some people that didn't even realize that anything they went through like had affected them at all. There's some people that have gone on with their lives and, and not even thought about this until the program came out. Yeah. And it's, it's and, really you know, I've, I've, I've had my girlfriend watch the program. I haven't seen it yet, but she binge watched it for a day and a half. Did she, you know, she to get through, go through a program? She didn't go through a program, did she? No, she didn't. As a matter of fact, um, she was my best friend in junior high, and she married my other best friend when she was a teenager. And they wondered why that I didn't go to the wedding is because I was sent to Spring Creek Lodge. And sometimes she gets confused. It's like, I don't understand some things the way that you are sometimes. Yeah. And I had her watch it, and she's like, well, a lot of it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like kind of like, uh, in a good way or a bad way? She's actually kind of in a sad way. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's good because now we have mm -hmm. something that we can point to and be like, OK, you want to know why I was gone in high school or why I disappeared or why I am the way I am? Go watch this and then we'll talk. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And it makes it a lot easier to for other people to digest <laughs> if you haven't been through that kind of thing before. Well, yeah. And like I said, I mean, my brother had it worse than I did. And I actually talked to him, you know, about his experiences and stuff. He's like, you know what? Yeah, it sucked. But in a lot of ways, it made me better. You know, I'm not going to talk about his personal business, you know, put it out there and everything. But, um, you know, he had a pretty fucking heart. He was in Samoa for two years. And I've heard the stories that came out of Samoa. Yeah. You know, and then he went to Spring Creek. He graduated, and then he ended up getting sent back. How long was he there the second time? Do you know? Um, a couple months. <clears throat> and did, um, no. have you talked to your brother since the program came out? Um, I no, I kind of touched base with him. I didn't really want to dive into it because he's like, hey, listen, that's a chapter of my life that I put behind me, like, there's a lot of things that's good about it. I mean, he's on the he's on the um, one of the pages and stuff because yeah. I've seen his likes and stuff across it and everything. He just doesn't interject because he's like, you know, I'm dealing with my own life. I like, you know, this or that. But yeah, and all the power to him. You know, if he doesn't, if he doesn't want to, if he's put it behind him, all the power to him. You know. <clears throat> well, that's the whole thing about like I've seen a few posts about people who don't want to watch it because it'll bring up too much traumatic in the past. Yeah, that's and fine. you know what? That's okay. You know, it's okay to not remind yourself of the trauma that you worked so hard to get past. Yeah. You know, and if you're at a state and if you're at a steady place in your life right now where you're pretty level headed, would I want to go back and expose myself to something like that and risk throwing myself for a loop again? Probably not. So I right. You know, I've seen, I've seen a lot of posts uh, recently about some of the staff members that were there. i um, not going to name any names or anything because I don't have their permission to mention them. Um, but uh, one of the person was a graduate, came back as a staff member, ended up marrying another person who ended up being a staff member or whatever, but she came back and everything. And you know what? For us, we thought it was cool. We, like, it gave us those who were still in it, like, well, maybe there's actually something to it. You know, maybe there's something to be learned. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know that there was a part to play. The worst thing for me, um, as we went along, sorry, I'm kind of skipping around. No, you're the worst thing for me was group feedback. Because, like I said, I got sent there for running away for a weekend while my parents were in um, this Discovery with my brother down in Utah. That's trippy. And everything's 
So they weren't even in town, but I still went to school come Monday. And then that next night is when I was sent away and everything. But um, on the aspect, like I knew what paid for me being there. My grandfather left me and my brother a college fund with over $200,000 in it. You know, and that's what paid for it. And that's kind of for me is what when I realized that, you know what, they're not above lying to us. Because I've had staff members saying, telling me that your dad's out there working two jobs to keep you here. Mm-hmm. No, he's not. My dad was he worked at a nuclear power plant. He was a supervisor. This dude made like over forty dollars an hour. Yeah, but that wasn't paying what that wasn't what was paying for us being there. Yeah, that was just a guilt trip to try and make you work your program or whatever they were trying to get you to do. It's one of their tactics. Yeah, but group feedback and everything, like what I was sent there for, and I got like. Kids in my family that were 14, 12, the 12 year old hawked his family's vehicle to pay for drugs. The 14 year old came in and he had to be isolated for a couple of weeks because he was going through heroin withdrawals. Now, what am I going to say to these people? Yeah. What do I know about their walk of life? Nothing. Yeah. But you're still being exposed to it. Yeah. But I couldn't say anything because what am I actually going to say? Yeah. And, you know, I run the program to lower levels, hands down. I can go to level one to level freaking three all-stars within a week. I did it repeatedly just to prove a point. Yeah. But every time I went up to level four, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, you're not participating. You're yeah. not giving feedback. Yeah. Well, yeah, what am I going to say? Like, if I'm going to speak something from the heart like you guys asked me to then it's going to be from the heart it's going to have some substantial you know i'm not going to just play the game and throw some bull crap i mean how many times have we heard oh you're being fake yeah that's the easiest thing to say too because you don't have to specify how they're being fake you just say you're being fake yeah <laughs> and the worst part about it is is when somebody tells you something like that oh don't rebuttal just take it in if it doesn't fly let it you know, if it doesn't apply, let it fly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have to internalize everything that they're saying. But if you, but if you let it fly, then you're being fake because you're not listening. Yeah. Even if it doesn't apply at all to you. Yeah. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Yep, mm. exactly. Did they make you admit to things that you didn't do or try to make you admit to things that you didn't do when you were there? Um, they... Trying to hint towards that I was lying, that I'd really done more because otherwise I would not have been sent to the program. Okay. But they never got to say anything like about yourself. Okay. Yeah. Because usually they do that. No, because I, 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 I wouldn't. I mean, they tried to pressure and pressure and pressure, but the thing is, I was kept true to I'm being honest. That was my standpoint, is honesty. Because all you have is your honesty and integrity. You know, if you let that go just to play the program, you know, and everything, then you're not really learning anything. You're learning bad habits. Yeah. You know, and to this day, I'm still honest to a fault. Yeah, which a lot of people did, including me. I mean, I I gave in eventually. And and also, it doesn't make you a bad person to give in. It just means that the program was able to get to you. You know what I mean? Some people. Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not saying it's a bad thing for because you know everybody's got individual things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, and if you, if you're like, if this is what it has to happen, just so to get through it, then you know, because we all realize that it was a process, and the process eventually had an end. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there was a way to get there, but mm-hmm. you have to pretty much sacrifice your autonomy. And for some of us, like for me, I didn't feel like I had a choice because they told me they were going to just put take me to Jamaica without telling my parents. And so I I, I pretty much was scared into it. Um, but that's the way they break you. You know what I mean? They, they get you to a point and they either break you or they don't. Well, it's a different situation for everybody else. Like I had it a lot easier. Like if you had it the way that I had it then you wouldn't know how to do that. 
you know, I heard that it got worse and worse over the years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, I was I was still there, and, and you know, I was in I was there at Spring Creek when it was still before they even built the new cabins. Yeah, you were at you were at Spring Creek almost like in their, in their not in their infancy, but like the step after their infancy. Like they were just starting to get things going. Is isn't that correct? They were toddlers, so they were beginning to walk, but they were still stumbling here or there. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> And how long were you there again? Uh, I was only there for a year. I actually was taken home on my year date, which I thought was a little bit weird that I wasn't allowed to go to class, but I did offer for the work at the chow hall, you know, the hungry horse, because I loved, you know, getting out of routine, doing something and yeah. working in just like your own space. And anybody who's worked on the hungry horse, it was a nice release. Definitely, definitely. It was a change yeah. of pace. Mm-hmm. So I was taken out of the chow hall on my year, and I thought it was weird that my English instructor was kind of like, because it changed from a skirner to uh, a gentleman and everything, and he told me, like, remember, the world's a beautiful place. I'm like, okay. thought that was a little bit weird, but, you know, went there, and then I was called to the office, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? And my dad was there. He's like, well, do you want to go home, or do you want to continue? Well, of course I want to go home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you, so, what, yeah. What happened after the program? Did we go into this in the last one? Sorry, I keep my, you were like my. No, friend. no, no, we didn't. So I was uh, 10th grade at that point because uh, with the nice thing about the homeschooling program, and then I apologize to anybody who had their library privileges revoked after me because apparently I was the one that revoked a lot of people from going to the library. I do apologize about that. That was me. They thought I was flirting with the Miss Gurner's daughter who worked in the library. Nope, I was just checking out books. Yeah. I read three books a day. So I do apologize. They misinterpreted that. Um, but I uh, got home and everything. So back in public school, which was a little bit weird in itself. But I was excited to reconnect with friends that you know, I previously had. Uh, my brother decided to tell on me the uh, first week of uh, being back because I had a best friend in orchestra. Never dated or anything, wasn't anything sexual, just she was literally my best friend. Well, Derek saw me holding her hand throughout the high school, you know, just happy to have contact and be back with her, nothing inappropriate, no kisses or anything like that. And then I got home, and yeah, I got the uh, read the riot act about holding a girl's hand. You were still under the life contract. Did you go home under mm -hmm. a life contract? Nope. Okay. So what? Why were they? Why did they get on you about that? Uh, well, my dad did because he he thought that I was going back into like, oh my god, you're oh, okay, okay. just jumping right. I'm sorry, holding a girl's hand is really not that big of a deal. We were in orchestra together. Yeah. She was my best friend. We'd never dated. We'd never talked about dating. She was just a really good friend. She gave me the biggest hug when I came back. And that was my way of connecting with her, you know, because everybody else I shied away from. Yeah. You know, my best friends that I had beforehand... I didn't get to see or anything else. They'd already dropped out of school or whatever else. Yeah. And so it was really nice to have a connection. And that was it. And your dad didn't want you that to happen, so what happened then? <laughs> oh, no, he thought that I was being a teenage boy because I was 16 at the time, so we figured that I was trying to sow some oats, yeah. which I wasn't. Yeah. But... So, yeah, I got thrown underneath the bus. Um, I was grounded for about a month. Wow. Which, okay, nobody called me on the phone anyway. I still stayed at home, did my homework, did my chores. Mm -hmm. You know, and then continued to finish and uh, did completed out of high school. I didn't have a plan after high school, so it was either work a day and job at the mill or go in the military. So I joined the Navy. Because my dad would not allow me to join the Marine Corps or the Army out of high school because I signed up when I was 17. 
But I joined the Navy because I figured, you know, family tradition. My dad was in the Navy. My grandfather was in the Navy. Okay. Mm. Mm. What what comparisons yeah. can you what comparisons can you draw between uh, the mil, uh, being in? Uh, I'm sorry, you said the Navy, right? Well, oh yeah, out of high school. So yeah. that. So what comparisons? Yeah, what comparisons between the um between the trouble teen industry and uh, or between with the WASP schools and uh, the military could you could you make? Um. Or, or if they similar. Oh, no, they were pretty similar. I mean, the difference is, is when you go into the military, you know that boot camp is not going to be fun. But the similarities between this is when you go to bed, it's lights out, this is when you wake up, you know, the fire guard, same thing as in the program. You got to, you know, do your fire watch and everything in the middle of the night. Um, you got to keep your bed and stuff a certain way. You got to keep this and that, you only eat at certain times, there's no taking food outside. Um, essentially to scare you into doing what it is that they want. You know, because in the military they threaten you with, um, well, if you've lied about this or this or this, we will find out. And you will spend, you know, you could get punished under the UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice. You know, so you get used to the routine, but essentially boot camp is scaring you into doing what they want, which is essentially what the program did, scaring you into doing what they wanted. Yeah. Now, there were some horrible staff members, but there were also some good ones. You know, everybody wants to concentrate on the bad ones. I, I was lucky. I had some pretty good staff members. My caseworker, Lori Traver, which she got married, but apparently now she's back to Lori Traver. Um, I had the two family fathers that I had were Dave and I forget his last name, but somebody mentioned his last name not too long ago. And then Jeff, you know, I remember talking to Jeff about like, cause when I was in the program, I hadn't lost my virginity. And he told me that, you know, when he was younger, he didn't have a choice of losing his virginity. You know, he went to a party, was all innocent and everything. And he woke up with somebody already making it happen so to speak yeah 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 mm. sorry trying to keep things appropriate for the podcast no, no, no you're you're perfectly fine you're perfectly fine so um <clears throat> do you what do you feel like or did you want to touch on that thought anymore before i move on well up to you okay i'm kind of squirrely brained right now so i apologize but oh, no you're perfectly fine mm. uh what do you think since you say you you got some stuff out of the program, I know you did get some positive stuff out of the program. Um, mm -hmm. What 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 do you think helped you the most from the program? If you spend long enough in either a situation or around certain somebody, you know, if you're wondering whether or not they're being real or not, because that is actually a real thing, whether somebody's being real or fake, because a lot of people blow a lot of smoke. Time is what makes it, you know, you give enough. I, I have this thing that I use. I will give you enough rope to hang yourself with. Yeah. And then if you hang you yourself. You know, if you're true. It, yeah, if you're true to it, then, uh, you know, for what you say, then I'll never have any question because I'm not going to doubt you on the beginning. Yeah. At all. And even through it, I hope that I don't have to doubt you. But if I'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself with, like you'll either prove what you're saying is true or not. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, like I'm honest to a fault. Like my girlfriend, she, she doesn't like some of the things that I have to say sometimes. And she gets pissed at me. And it's not even bad things. I'm just like, I know that she's not going to like to hear this, but I'm going to be honest. Yeah. It's just what it is. And I do try to have verbal tact. You know, because that is a difference. You can be rude and honest at the same time. Yeah. You know, my brother used to tell me all the time, well, I'm not being rude. I'm just being honest. It's just you don't like to hear it. That's the program talking. Yeah. You can be honest and still figure out a way to come across to your audience. You have to know the audience you're talking to and how they're going to take it. You're not in control of anybody else's emotions, true. But 
if you know them well enough, you know that there's a certain way to come across that they will receive that information. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's another reason I try and be <clears throat> try and see all different viewpoints on my podcast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I feel like there is a yin and yang to the universe. There really is. And there's a balance between things. Absolutely. Does, does that mean that everybody had positive and negative experiences in the program? No. Does that mean everybody had no, all negative all. experiences? No. Does that mean everybody mm -hmm. had all positive? No. What it means is that everybody had their own experience in their own way. That's what it means. Exactly. We all come from different walks of life. Like I've served with people in the military that were, you know, black, Mexican, or whatever else. And, you know, from Louisiana, from Georgia, from Iowa, from, you know, all walks of the country. What connected us is the fact that, guess what? We're all there together. We had a saying in the military, embrace the suck. And we embraced it together. We were there for each other. Yeah. You know, and as far as the program goes, there's a lot of people in family. Not everybody clicked within families, let's face it. We all had those people that were kind of like, eh, you're kind of an asshole. And yeah. Like, oh, you're kind of a, you know. So, but you have those people because you're all going through it together. It's kind of like with the military and combat situations is if you take a look at as a teenager, the program was our combat situation. We banded together through the trauma of it. There was those that we could rely on, and there was those that uh, just refused to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? On all accounts, it's okay. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Where you're at is where you're at, and that's perfectly fine. And that's what the program itself didn't understand. Where you're at is where you're at, and that's okay. Yep. They were they trying to push you to be in a certain place. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Did you, um, <clears throat> have you talked to your, your parents at all since the program came out? Uh, are you going to? Um, I haven't talked to them about the program because it's still a sensitive subject between my mom and then my dad. You know, they got different viewpoints on it, and I'm just not going to place them in that because, you know, whatever it is that they are willing to be accountable for or not, that's kind of on them. And I'm not looking for them. I'm not looking to them to validate the way that I feel about it or what I said because we've all heard about, you know, them telling parents and parents saying, Oh, you're just manipulating or you're lying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we weren't, but I'm 40 years old. I don't need that validation anymore. Yeah. I really don't care. I mean, if he wanted to take accountability for things, because my parents both blame each other for sending us away. The thing is, is it was a two part thing. Yeah. So it is what it is. And I've gone on the philosophy of, uh, don't ask questions that you don't want the answer to. Amen to that. <laughs> you know, because it's not going to affect my life one way or the other. I'm 40 years old. I got a career. I got a family. You know, whether or not that they admit what they did was wrong or the fact that uh, they didn't realize. You know, my, and my dad took it pretty far. He even went to Spring Creek, set up a basketball camp and everything. And, you know, that was great for the kids while we were there. But then dad and the guy who actually escorted me to Spring Creek, um, they started doing their own seminars. You know, offline and everything else, but that didn't last very long. Yeah. You know, but apparently my dad believed in it enough that he was like, oh, yeah, something hit for my dad. And if, if it did, good for him. Yeah. But I'm not going to bring up what you did to me back when I was 15 years old. Yep. And that's completely fair. That's perfectly fine. You know, 25 years ago, what I've done with my life since then has been all on me. I've been through much worse things. Yeah. I believe that uh, at that time, he did the best that he knew how to do with. And maybe they got to him. You know, maybe maybe it made sense to him and something clicked for him. Which, okay. Mm. Yeah. 
You know, I know as a father myself, I would never send my kids away. I talk to my kids. I do everything. I actually interjected from my oldest being sent away when he was 15. He's now 22. They were thinking about sending him away to military school. I said, give me a year with him. And you know what? For the first time in his life, he had straight A's. He was honest. Came home. He did his chores. He didn't always do well because he was a teenager. But we talked about it. And you know what? When he had his ass chewing, he understood why. And I talked to him. I didn't degrade him. I talked to him like a man. There are different ways to go about things. Definitely. What do you think you needed instead of being sent away? Or do you think that being sent away was, I mean, none of us deserve to be sent away. We all know that, right? But do you feel like that was an appropriate response on your parent? Or do you feel like you something else would have worked better for you? No, I literally remember the conversation that I had with them because it was Halloween night um, back in 96 because I got sent away like the next fucking day after I got home. Um, was saying like, I want to come home, but don't send me away to the program. I'll come home if you promise not to send me to the program. You can give me an ass tune, you can grab me for whatever, I'll be in, you know, whatever rule. Then I was lied to. All I wanted was communication because I wanted to talk about how I felt. Because prior to that, I talked to my dad about how I didn't like certain things that he was doing, but I was afraid to talk to him. You know, my dad's like, oh, okay, well, I just don't want to do that when uh, you're around. Which doesn't make you feel good. You're not really listening. I don't like it when you flirt with other women. Yeah. Because you're married to my mom. Yeah. You know, dirty jokes or whatever else, but, oh, okay, well, I just want to do it when you're around. Yeah, that's not... That's deflecting, and that's also, you know, not not listening to what you actually – because he it's not that he's doing it around you. It's that he's doing it at all. Well, yeah, because – and the only reason that I would – the only reason I had a problem with it is because it affected my mom emotionally. So I knew that it was wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you feel – so do you feel like if they had told you we're going to send you the program regardless – just because if they had been honest with you, would that have helped? Would that have been better for you if they had said, yeah, we're sending you regardless and you're going to come home? Or do you feel well, like- the honest? Well, the honesty would have been nice. I still would have come home because that, was, well, that would have been the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I had my little rebellious moment and everything, but I would have come home. They were like, okay, well, because you did that, then I'm going to send you to the program. At least I would have been prepared. And not waking up at three o'clock in the morning because my whole thing from there is like, okay, dad, then you at least drive me. Yeah. You know, they, they took my shoes away thinking that it was going to stop me from quote unquote running. I had no, I had no plan of freaking running, but I guarantee you, I knew that strip of interstate from when we first pulled over. Like I didn't need shoes. If I wanted to run away off of that, I could have, because I know the woods better than freaking in Montana. Like me and Derek could have fucking ran away. You know, people are like, oh, there's no food. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we, we grew up in the country. Yeah, you just Trust have to, me. if you know where it's at, you can do it. I'm not saying we could have survived out there as teenagers for months on end, but trust me, we could have lasted a couple days for them to go searching in the wrong direction, and then yeah. we would have ended up in town. Yeah. No, we wouldn't ask for help because, like, guess what? Everybody knew Spring Creek was there. Yeah. Now, trust me, we were intelligent enough to know what to do or what not to do. We were just, we're like, is it really worth it? Or just like, fuck it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Is it really worth the fucking risk? For real. <laughs> were you there uh, when uh, Carly Newman hung herself? Uh, I don't think so. I never heard about anybody hanging themselves. Okay. Mm. Must have been after your time. Um. Did you ever hear about anybody giving speeches uh, for the Montana Meth Project from Spring Creek Lodge when you were there? Montana Meth Project? No, because uh, back when I was there, meth wasn't really that big of a deal yet. Okay. Mm. I may, I to may, my knowledge, I could, I could be wrong. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, that's totally fine. I mean, I've, I've heard from a few people. I think it was after your time, but I'm making a connection be, because there is a connection between the Montana Meth Project and Spring Creek. I'm just not sure exactly what it is yet. Um, they were sponsoring kids to be sent there through the Montana Meth Project. So that's a whole nother can of worms I'm working on right now, but... <clears throat> I'm not saying that the I'm not saying that the program may have been the intervention that some people may have needed at that age. Maybe not to the degree of, and I'm not speaking about what some of the things that I've heard about people coming out, you know, coming out of the woodworks and stuff. About if you know what, if the staff had done exactly what they were supposed to do and not been abusing their power. Thank you for saying it that way. I was looking for the words. Yeah, if they hadn't been abusing their power, if they were strictly like up and up about everything, not have their own agenda or anything else, then it could have been a, a lot of good for a lot of people. Exactly. But as most things, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yep. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. I totally agree. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else you want to touch on about? life afterwards or your time there or what you learned or anything like that i will say that it's a little bit more difficult for me to connect with somebody because when somebody like i don't try to hide myself like when i for example like relationship wise i don't try to hide myself i put it out there out of the beginning this is who I am. I'm goofy. I'm a nerd. I'm dorky. I make goofy jokes. I make dad jokes. You know, type of thing. But I take it really freaking hard when I'm being accused of lying. Oh, you're lying. This isn't... Because I've been called a liar so many freaking times in the program that it I have to step away because it enrages me. Yeah, it's a trigger for you. Mm. Pretty much. Is there anything else like that from the program that triggers you? Well, I deflect the humor. If something's getting uncomfortable for me, then I'll just make a joke and, you know, step sideways. Yep. Mm. Yep. Definitely. Um. I appreciate you know. you. I appreciate you coming on the show. Like I appreciate you being one of my first interviews and being so brave to. I mean, because when you did the interview, like there was only like three people before you, so you didn't know that this was gonna go anywhere or do anything. So I mean, I probably well, I think it would, but you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. I think you both. Yeah, we, um, we can we can hope, and you know, look where it is now. So <clears throat> I think it's awesome that you come came on the show. I think it's awesome that we get, you know, varying perspectives because that's important, you know, because if we were to come out here and just talk about all the negative and that was all we talked about, people are going to start saying, oh, well, I'm sure that, you know, there were some people, you know, because <clears throat> it's black and white thinking, right? It's not all bad and it's not all good, right? There's somewhere in the middle. So if we were to say yeah. everything was negative, people wouldn't be as receptive to it. You know what I mean? They wouldn't be able to relate to it as much, especially people well, at least that's that's how I feel. So I feel like having a a balance. Oh, absolutely. Of before before you even blew up, before we even had our first interview, I was already reconnected with two people that was in my family: Travis Brown and Chris Cooper. Yep. Mm. That's it helps with stuff like that. So I'm really happy that we've been able to make mm. such an impact. Is there anything else? That's all because of you, man. Yeah, I thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, is there anything you want people to know about anything else? I will say that uh, we all come from different areas of the program, whether it be Tranquility Bay, whether it be Spring Creek, whether it be Jamaica, whether it be Utah, whether, it, you know, we've all been subjected to things that we rather forget, but there's a reason we don't forget them. And don't think of it necessarily as negative or triggering. Don't expect people to, as far as parents go, to always understand or anything. Because there's going to be parents that, you know, oh, well, I'm not watching this. I'm not doing that. 
don't feel bad. Okay, you're taking strength on your own. You're opening up, and it, yes, it is hurtful if they don't, if they're not willing to at least see where you're coming from. But they don't have to. We're adults now. We are our own strength. Our traumas have made us strong. Our what we've been through have taught us a lot about, and they've helped cultivate who we are today. Now, there's a lot of people that have struggled with addictions, with drugs, and everything. And you know what? A lot of them overcame it, and a lot of them didn't. Don't focus on what caused it. Focus on your strength. Focus on the fact that, you know what? We made it through. And every day, we choose our life on who we want to be. And you know what? If we don't succeed that day, there's always a new day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I agree. Wholeheartedly, 100%. Don't be so hard on yourselves, people. Just and realize what you can control and what you can't control. And just work on what you do have control over. Because we don't have control over how others receive us. We have control over how we respond and how and what we do so and sometimes we have to suck it in yeah and it sucks but you know what there's always somebody out there even if we haven't found them yet that we can talk with yep and you're not alone there's always somebody that's been through something similar to what you've been through so i want people to <clears throat> if you watch this far in the video please share 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 like 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 subscribe Get these videos out there to their farthest reaches of the interwebs and let's get these places shut down. And yeah, if anybody's interested in sharing their story, email me and we will catch you on the next one. Bye, y'all. Hey, thanks for your time, bud.